during lunch and also now during the talks, I've been hearing a lot, yeah, Angular and React and Vue. So um, obviously we're software developers and we use this ecosystem to build uh, single uh, page web applications. I mean, it's great, but it leaves the question open. What about traditional websites? Are they still needed? Um, are they obsolete? And what was the web all about? Do we still need that? And that's what our next speaker is going to shed light on. Henrik, he calls himself an industrial designer by heart. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I'm really, really wondering what he's going to tell us. So please give us a warm round of applause for Henrik. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, by day, I'm a web developer. Um, or a web engineer, sometimes I'm a web designer, depends on the project. And uh, we probably do all the same things day to day. But uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, 35 years professionally. And uh, after a while you're like, well, that's really the same. That's also the same. And you get bored of a lot of things and then you start thinking about, well, what if it was different? And was it better before? Is it better now? Can it be better tomorrow? So uh, that's the sort of line of thinking that I'm going to go through, and it's, it's not a finished line of thoughts, but there, there are bits and pieces that I've put together in a talk, so hopefully it'll give you something to think about uh, in a bit longer perspective. So how many of you have made a traditional web page by hand, not an Angular app or React app or anything? Okay, how many tried it to do it 10 years ago with the current technology then? Okay, how many tried to do it 20 years ago with the current technology then? I'm not saying one thing is better or the other, I was just curious about the experience um, of different people. So this talk is about, um, is the web in, and what our usual context these days, as opposed to, say, 10 years ago, is usually we talk about single-page applications. Uh, a lot of people would say, yeah, but why would you need more than one web page? We have single-page applications. It's the way forward. Problem solved. We don't need anything else. It's really becoming the default, and when you have conversations with uh, managers and business leaders that are hiring and setting up projects, it seems that it's heading towards that best practice area. And when something becomes best practice in my experience, it's the wrong solution. <laughs> That's usually the thing. It's what happened to a lot of web server technologies before, that the, the ones that won were not really the ones that produced the best results, but they seem to fit the culture or fit some other, or the sales process or some other property, but not necessarily the problem. And we should be focusing on the problem we're solving and fi figuring out the best way to solve the problem, not the best way based on what sells or what fits in the organization, although those also are important. We have to accept that. So, <clears throat> fundamentally we are, yeah, I should go back there, that's a bit. Too fast. So, of course, we also make a ton of web pages with Wix and Squarespace and WordPress is a big uh, dominant web uh, host. And it is the, how the most web pages are served. And, but the consensus beyond templates is really that we should be using JavaScript. And we're talking more and more about as if we're coding an application the way it was done before before the web. So it's worth reminding us what the original idea of the web was and the context it came up in, because we always have change. It's, there's always change. Maybe we have swung to one extreme. Maybe we're swinging the other direction. Maybe we're going in a completely different direction. So this is just my personal mental model of how to think about this. So the app is a great concept. We had apps before the web, and the app is like a tool. It's like a hammer. You, you use a hammer for certain things and not for certain other things. If you have an app, you install that app, you acquire that app beforehand because 
you want to solve a particular problem over and over and over, you go and purchase a hammer and you have a hammer in the house because you need a hammer at some point in the future. That's why you get the hammer. That's why you get the app. <clears throat> An app can also be for a particular process. So you have a mold, you tend to make, or you, know, you make shoes as a business, so you have a mold for a shoe, and for each size of shoe you have a different mold, and the mold can be used to make that particular shoe perfectly. And it's really good at that. It's absolutely, and we wouldn't want to make shoes without molds, probably not. We try 3D printing and that might succeed, but that's not going to replace all production of shoes. There will be the case for the app. The app will always have a use case in some way or another because we have to have these single purpose things. But the, con the fundamental concept with the web browser was that we took the typical use case and said, okay, so can we, put, can we make a single app that has all this stuff that we do over and over and over? And then can we focus on the content? Can we focus on the thing that we are about? So, can, and, and that's obviously in digital, that's very different from physical. You can't really say that I want to go to a hardware store and purchase the solution of putting nails in a wall. Can you please give me that? How much will it cost? That's, you can't buy that. But in software, we can. In software, we can do a lot of things that we can't do physically. So that's why the web browser is useful, because it focuses on the content within the web browser. It focuses on what's on the page, what I want to communicate. So if I have a web server, I'm communicating something to you, and it's the content that I'm putting in the web page that I'm communicating. So it's the content, not the tool. The content that we're talking about is based on symbol, symbols and symbolic content. It's about the definition. We define something, and then we can elaborate on what it is. So think, for instance, Wikipedia. That's a perfect, that fits perfectly with the web, because Wikipedia is all about declaring some word or sentence or something and explaining what it means. And then you, in there, you can declare something, and you can go on and on and on. So that sort of um, problem where we want to understand something or see the relationship between th things, the web, the original web is really good at. And that was really what we acquired it for. That was the job to be done for the web browser. It can give us a way to think. It's a way of thinking about symbolic content, how things relate, what they mean, what, what follows on from something. Associations. So what is HTML? It's semantic content, and you can think about it in the way that auth an author would think about it, that it's about the storytelling or the, the words or the dif different f of the flow, of the progression of what you're telling or what you're saying or what you're presenting. Or you can think of it as a visual representation. Or the way a lot of uh, people talk about it in single-page app terminology is that it's a minor detail. It's just something that we put somewhere in a random JavaScript file, and it's not really important what it is, as long as it presents the right bit of visual something. So we, we put this whole conceptual power in a little corner, and that's sometimes exactly the right thing to do, and sometimes it's not. And I'm thinking it's, we, we may be doing it too much if single-page apps were to be the default solution. Then we would lose a lot, I think. What we get from the HTML page is we declare what our current view of the world is in, in terms of this topic that we're asking for. So if you go to a web page, it has to have some topic of some sort. If you design a web page, you try to design it so that it has a single call of action. There's one thing it's about, and there's one thing you want the user to do next. You don't want to present a thousand different options, because that's confusing. You want a natural, meaningful way to consume what's there, 
and then go on to the next logical thing. So sometimes you have more than one call of action, maybe you have a couple, maybe you have to make a choice, do I want to do this, do I want to do that? But you don't present a million different options. You don't say, the world is open and you can eat anything you want. Because as humans, we're not very good at that sort of scenario. So there's a, the way things, the, uh, when I present you with a web page, I'm saying, this is my view of the world today. If you ask for the same web page tomorrow, I might have changed my view, so I might give you a different content. And you can compare those two, and you can say, you thought that yesterday, and today you're thinking that. There's a difference. You're not in agreement what has changed. Try doing that with JavaScript. Try doing that with an image. It's very hard in comparison when it's not semantic. You, you lose the context, you lose the relationships. It's hard to tease apart and it's, yeah. <laughs> HTML also fits in the brain. Maybe, and I won't blame you if you hate the HTML syntax, I think that's completely distraction of the discussion. The point is, it's small enough that you can reason about it. You don't reason about 100,000 lines of JavaScript. I have been responsible for 200,000 lines, and it's not fun. It's, I mean, you, eventually, after a couple of years, you have a good picture of it, but it's not something you can consume in a realistic time. And the point of the semantic reduction of a, of a web page or of HTML is that you only have there what's essential for piecing everything together logically as in a more of a human kind of thinking than in a machine kind of thinking. That's, the, that's to me, the purpose of HTML. Maybe we came up with the wrong syntax. That's really irrelevant for, the, for this line of thought. And it comes from that it's declarative. Declarative, um, when you go from declarative to procedural, you are losing information because you don't have the relationships. You're reducing it to first you do the, this, then you do that, then you do that, then you do that. And yes, you can, you can sort of say that we can do everything with procedural. Yes, true. But we are losing something. We're losing comprehension, and we have to remember that. Okay, maybe that was also too fast. I think it's also worth thinking about the incentives that we have. Incentives is usually what drives what we do. So as an engineer, I have an incentive to add a feature to an existing product. And I have an incentive to do that by writing new code, not modifying ex existing, because it's easier. It's simply easier. If I can just hook something in somewhere, I can write a new class, a new function, new something that will extend the existing system with that one extra piece, which is why our software grows and grows and grows and grows, because the incentive is to write new stuff, not to go the other way and reduce the complexity, because reducing complexity is really, really hard. It requires a lot more skill than adding something onto the existing and you don't get rewarded for it. You don't get a raise because you reduced 10% of the code base of an existing software. You don't. I mean, you should, but you don't. And if you're a designer, you usually go through an education where you, you learn to think visually. You learn to, you have a graphic education. It's focused on doing things graphic, and it's a lot about opinions, about what is nice and what is not nice, which is important. Don't get me wrong, I think it is important. I think we're going about it wrong, but it's the, the fact that visual expression is, to a large extent, uh, a different thing that, than rational, symbolic discussion. That's important. But there's also an incentive of designers to produce screens. The business will communicate around, this screen is good or bad, this screen is for something, so designers have an incentive to produce more screens. In their designs and as engineers, we then are pushed to producing more 
implement more screens, and again, it grows and grows and grows. So there's something there that's not working very well. Symbols are really good for rational thought. It's the basis of, of our literature. It's the uh, basis of all the code we write. We use symbols. It's basically what programming languages are. It's a collection of symbols and their meaning and how we tie them together. Um, symbolic meaning is how we reason about things, but it's not how we experience everything. And human experience at the end of the day is a very powerful motivator. So on the web, it seems that we've sort of not solved the other ways of thinking very well. We figured we have tools that are around the symbols and symbolic thought, rational thought, and their relationship, but the whole is like, how do we deal with images and video and audio and all these things? We don't have any sort of very rich, powerful uh, systems, formats uh, for them. They're, they're fairly crude, actually, when you think about them logically. So, in terms of the apps, they're fine. I'm not criticizing apps. It's not really that it's about... It's just, it just shouldn't be our primary approach because it's not going to scale. I mean, if we look at uh, the number of jobs people are talking about, of engineers and designers, and so on, it's ridiculous numbers. It's, it's not realistic. I, uh, what is it? 20 million new engineers that's needed? Where are they going to come from? I, I know how long time it takes to take somebody to an initial th way of thinking in engineering, software engineering, to being a strong software engineer. That's a major undertaking, and we can't expect everybody to do this. This is just, it's not realistic. And would we want everybody to think the same way? I don't think so. We want different thought. We want, we want to accommodate different ways of thinking. We don't want to say that everybody has to be extremely strong at numbers. Why? I mean, numbers are great. They're great for symbolic thinking. They're great for rational thought. But why do you want that to be a minimum requirement for everybody? And why would you want everybody to be great authors? I mean, it's very powerful. It helps. I would definitely advise everybody to try and increase their skills in authoring. But why would you, we want to try and make it a minimum requirement? It's very easy to just say, well, people should be able to do this, 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 and this. But it's harder to do it. And in our tools and our technologies, we are setting the minimum bar for what is required in order to use them. Web page size. Yeah, it's growing. 15% and 15% and 15%. And in principle, it's okay, because we're getting faster internet. I mean, my fiber at home is way faster. It's not so fast today, because actually the connection is not there for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but it's not realistic to just think that way. This is really oversimplification, because what about when you go for a hike in the mountains and you don't have that good coverage? Um, what about if you don't live in an area that's covered by fiber? Yes, but it's coming tomorrow, and in the near future, we're all going to have pervasive internet, and there's going to be a plug in the wall, and it's always going to work. You know when I heard that? 99 from the head of technology innovation in Denmark. He was making a keynote speech, and he said, in a couple of years, we're going to have pervasive internet, you're going to have a plug in the wall everywhere. It's never going to happen. We have to make things that will work today, not things that will work in a dreamy future. Uh, we have to demand more of the things we do. We can't just put up with the status quo. So HTML takes up 5%, or the sort of semantic part is 5%. Because semantic compression is way better than any technology you can come up with. You can make zip, L, Z, H, whatever they're called. I don't care what your compression algorithm is. If your data is dumb, it's going to take up a lot of space. If you have symbolic meaning and relationships and all these things, the data size is tiny, and you can reason about it. 
That's why it's only 5%. Because if you have an image of a book, as in an image of all the pages in a book, you will have a lot of useless information. Most of it will be useless. More than 99% of, of it will be useless. Because the value to the reader is not the, exactly how the A on the first page looks. Because the A on the first page, conceptually, is the same as the A on the second page. Or, or the B on the second page is the same as the B on the third page. So it's a complete waste to capture a book by images in principle. It's obviously useful if you're going to lose the book tomorrow and all you have is pictures. But that's, again, not what we're talking about. So I think fundamentally what I'm exploring is the idea can we use more of this expressive expression of symbols and relationships to drastically reduce the content that we are using and the way we are building things? Somehow, I don't know, I don't have the answer, I just have questions. The web is also really good in terms of open to inspection. You can see that in different ways. For instance, if you're learning, it's really useful to look at how somebody else made a web page. That's getting harder and harder. That's how I learned the web in the beginning, because it was quite easy, because the web pages were small, and you didn't get a bundle of two megabytes of JavaScript that was obfuscated by some obscure build process that 100 Google engineers have spent five years on coming up with, plus Yahoo engineers and all the others that have done it in iterations over the past 15 years or so. And you have the meaning, you can go directly and inspect the meaning. The more you learn about the inspection tools, the more you can understand the relationships and the thoughts, and you can sort of tease out bit by bit and understand how is this working. A bit like a biologist would do about nature, look, t take it apart and look at how is it working and in their own head construct a, an, an understanding of what's going on. If we don't have this open to inspection in one way or another about the live system, not your source code that's hidden in some Git repository away in your secure firewall, corporates, whatever it is, that's not open to inspection. Open to inspection is open to inspection. And it, in open, it also enables sharing. It's easy to say, go look at my web page. If you open with that tool or look in that place, you'll see what I'm talking about. You don't have to say, oh, yeah, I can try and send you that tomorrow if I remember and so on. That's just not the same sort of property. So our current issues with the web, I think, are not really what we normally talk about as engineers. It's really like fundamental security, fundamental privacy, and fundamental maintainability. Fundamentally, the way we do it makes these problems bigger, not smaller. And we're not going to solve it tomorrow, but if we don't change the way we do things to a way where it inherently over time becomes better, it's going to become worse. So, all I have to left to think about are the qualities of the web we had, and to some extent still have, and then maybe what the opportunities are for going somewhere. The web browser identified initially just HTML. And he just said, HTML is a way to define the content that you're talking about, semantically. It doesn't reason about how it should be rendered on the screen. It doesn't reason about how your text should actually look like. It just says, here's a paragraph of text. And it's separate from that paragraph of text and that paragraph of text. And here's an, it, they didn't even have image in the beginning. So here's a link to some, something else. Here's something that is bold, that means that it has some weight compared to the other text. It's more important in some way. But it, was just, it just did that. It didn't do a million things, it just did one, solved one part of the problem. The web server saw, served another part of the problem. The web server was not there 
to describe the difference between one paragraph and the other paragraph. It was just there to deliver the files that would describe the content. Its approach was to declare the job for the computer, not to micromanage and specify exactly what the computer should be doing. And that's what we're reverting to. Our concept of programming for, the, for most people, not everybody, most people, um, is based on what fitted very well with how you should make an operating system in 1970. That was why the C language was invented. It was to write Unix, uh, and it was very good for that. And you can also use it today to make a lot of useful things, and it's appropriate for many things. But as a foundation for communicating intent and information, it's rubbish. I mean, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't model the train of thought that goes through your head. You have to, in your head, transform that. And the web declares what it is the computer should do. It doesn't declare how to do it. So it just says, you should display this information. Here are the different pieces and what they mean. It's up to you to decide how to do that. And then to deliver something at the time of need. With an application, we're installing it ahead of time. We are, we're saying, I will need a hammer next Monday. So Saturday, I'll have to buy the hammer. Because I know next Monday I'll need it. I can't s Monday show up and say, I need to hit, uh, put a nail in this wall, so hammer, please appear. It's not going to happen. I have to get the hammer first and then do it. With the web, you just ask for, this, for the solution or the thing you're looking for, and you get it immediately in the moment. Of course, that has drawbacks, but it also has the opportunity that, as the one delivering the web page to you, I can change the last second what it is I'm going to tell you. I can give you up-to-date, the up-to-date content or the up-to-date thing, I don't want to call it a tool, uh, that fits with the situation right now. So, opportunities. I think that we could maybe find a way to have a general purpose way to describe the domain models. So by domain models, I mean that in everything I've ever done, there are certain data and information that fits the domain problem or the, the area of the topic, the topic that's going on. So you always end up creating what's called a domain model, which is a data model that describes how we see the world, independent of how you want to present the world and communicate the world in the page. There's a more abstract or more hidden part that says, here's how I currently understand it. And sometimes the domain model is only needed um, in the web browser. Sometimes the domain model is only needed on the web server. But most of the time, you actually would ideally want to have it in both places. So I think there's an opportunity there to find a way, just like with HTML, to have some sort of way to describe domain models um, in a general and standardized common way. And if you have that, then I think you can do a more generative uh, UI, as in you can generate, based on rules, more of the user interface that we have in the web page or web browser or in some other tool that is there to complement or replace the web browser. I don't know what. But the more semantic information, the more information, the more context you have, the easier it is to generate the user interface that fits the current situation. At case in point, the classic uh, example, not very original. Uh, should you use radio buttons or should you use a drop down? Well, the general rule since 1983 was that if you have more than three options, it should be a drop down. Or if you have space on the screen, it should actually not be a drop down, it should be a multiple select list. That has always been the UI guidelines since forever. And for some reason, we haven't even gotten to the point where we can say, oh, if there's more than three, I'm going to do this. 
And if there's less than three, and then let it be up to how many options are there currently available. And then maybe we are having a problem around the centralized source approach with web, with the web. We get everything from the web server. It's all centralized around the single source of truth with the web server. Maybe there's something there where we can be not so centralized. We can be more local, more closer to the user, which limits the amount of privacy issues because if you never have the information on the web server, but only out at the at the close to the user, and it, if it stays there, well, it's up to it's up to the local area to protect it and keep it uh, safe and private. If it doesn't inherently need all to go through a central round trip over a central web server, there's clearly some benefit there somehow. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, questions, of course. Yeah. My colleague Reggie has the microphone. He's ready to run around. <laughs> you don't have to give me any questions or thoughts. Or I mean, obviously, this is just a line of thinking, and uh, it's obviously not what you're used to thinking about when you're sitting there and uh, figuring out what sh how should I put an input box here and how should it be positioned, or should I be using this language or that language? Am I mistaken? Is it the wrong way to think about it? Is it irrelevant? That's good. So uh, maybe your line of thinking is, you know, something changing. But when you say it has to be more open for inspection, then it becomes kind of a reverse engineering when we say, uh, you know, it's open for its inspection. If you read it, you take it, you know, in this competitive world, if everything is open for inspection and if you just copy paste it and use it in somewhere else, there, mm -hmm. are, there are issues that come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Copyright and reverse engineering. Absolutely. And all those licensing yeah. issues. It's difficult. It's I mean, in the projects I've done in the last 15 years, we've basically used 90% open source and not paid a single penny for it and taken all the credit. I mean, then, I mean uh, it's, it's difficult because we, we're happy to use other people's stuff and then claim it for our own and say nobody can see it. Yeah? And that's why it has to be inherent in the system and somehow the system has to win in order to force people to be more open. People are not going to make it open for inspection for their own good. Absolutely not. So do you think it's because of these big companies, tech companies? I don't want to blame anybody. I mean, small companies will do the same thing. I mean, do you, you think if you are a one-man band that you care a bit about open for inspection? No. You're, you're like, well, I have my uh, e-commerce site here, and uh, if nobody can do any with, anything with it, that's great to me. In the sense that, you know, all these big tech companies, they kind of, you know, uh, create a roadmap yeah. for everything. Yeah. You know, the way we see web right now mm -hmm. is because of all these big tech companies investing their own resources and, you know, creating some frameworks and uh, like TypeScript and Facebook created a framework. Of for course. Them. So they are, you know, kind of having their own point of interest here. Of course. This is why do you think this is because of that? that we are shifting towards something, you know... It's part of the reason, yeah. It's the incentives, right? We need to shift the incentives to make things different. It's not going to happen because I stand here and talk about it, right? It's the, it could happen because somebody comes out with a useful technology with different incentives that, that builds on itself, and it's like snowball effect. It's not going to look very interesting to begin with, but after a while, when it's rolled a couple of times down the hill, it'll start looking interesting to some community of people. And then if they are wildly more successful, interesting, something, with that approach, it wins. I mean, that's how technologies compete. And uh, um, yeah, it's not going to happen because it's the 
right thing to do or good thing to do. It's going to happen because there's an in a built-in advantage and incentive to use it. Okay, I just clarified my line of thought. No, absolutely. Is conquering with yours. Are we in agreement then? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, okay. I'm not completely sold out on that. Okay, fine. That way. This way, you know what I'm saying, right here. This is, no, no, this is just for you, for your future reference. You had a question, I think. I didn't say that. Was it two years ago? I was speaking about uh, a more conversational approach. Take take video streaming for instance. And that has nothing to do with HTML. With video streaming, you pr produce a list of the clips or the things that are happening, and it's a sequence of experiences. So there's a semantic there already in the video streaming. It goes from being a single black box of a video file that you play to being a sequence of steps in a video. And it's a completely different way of thinking about content than HTML, because HTML is like document, and it's it's a single flow of storytelling where you can jump around, whereas a video stream is a sequence where you can't jump around, you experience it as a sequence. There could be a lot more semantic meaning in a video stream than there is today. You can add subtitles, you can add voiceovers, you can add comments maybe, but I'm sure there's a lot of other things that you could add into that and make it more semantic. So it, that's what I take from HTML, is that the semantic relationship and identifying pieces in them, in terms of their meaning, beyond what you see. You could do the same with audio streaming, right? Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that we're going to have to evolve HTML to be richer, because that's the usual argument, oh, we'll make it nicer so that it can do more. May, I was suggesting the domain model, right? Most of the coding I've done is around this separate domain model and how to exchange the domain model consensus with the server and how to represent that in the page. Now, if there was a domain model that naturally, in a predefined way, interacted with the HTML and you could refer to the domain model from the HTML and the browser would take care of that, it would probably reduce 60% of the code uh, that, uh, that I maintain every day and have ever maintained. Um, I don't see why. It's, all, I, it's, the same, I'm, it's the same thing we do over and over and over again. I've never seen any variation in it. I mean, it's, if, if, if I take the opposites, uh, viewpoint, I would say, well, actually, we shouldn't have one type of string in programming languages. We should have multiple types of strings because, because why could it possibly all be strings? There must be a difference between strings. We should have many different things. Yeah, but we can't cram it in our head. That's the problem. We, we're really good at making everything very complex with the argument that, hey, there might be some corner case that we haven't solved. Yeah, but when Things like the web are general purpose tools. They're not for corner cases. Apps are for corner cases. Or that's more sort of the direction you go. When you have a very special, unusual thing then in, that is really important to do, it makes sense to make an app dedicated to that. And then you have all the expressive range where you have complete in control and you change the, the fundamentals of what things are and how they're pieced together. But we got something with the web browser in that it's a general solution to a lot of problems and there are a separation of concerns. Yeah? Okay, so time's up. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting views, also for the interesting discussion. Um, here's your chocolate.
Thank right. you. And um, we have a short break. Yes, please, applause. Thank you.